Hello, everybody. We are talking about indigenous artists you don't know. If you would like to grow as an artist and you can't take an art class, we've got everything you need here at Art Prof, critiques, tutorials, professional development, and workshops. Kat, this is your pick. Tell us about this artist. Uh, this is an artist named Ioanni Scares, and uh, she is part of the Kokatha and Nukunu people of South Australia. And a lot of her work is all just glass work, and it has themes of the effects of colonization on the indigenous peoples of Australia. And what I found really interesting about her bio was that she started off working admin in certain art institutions and eventually she became a student, studied glasswork, and now is a very prolific fine artist. Dorian, isn't it incredible the diversity from a work like this to this? Yeah, and honestly, I think a lot of successful artists are able to show their range. And in this case, it's definitely being demonstrated. I look at stuff like this and I can't conceive of, number one, how somebody thought of this and number two, how it gets made, especially with a material that's as difficult as glass. Kat, what do you think about this piece? I think I particularly love this shot of this piece because it really shows that all of her sculpture work is extremely interactive and you can see it from a lot of different points of views. I honestly think when you stand under this sculpture and see it from this point of view, it seems menacing. The way that it's sort of falling towards you, the way mm -hmm. that it's repeated in the shadows, it feels a little bit overwhelming. And I think when we see the diversity in Yoni Skiris's works, I think a lot of that comes with just experimentation, time spent with the medium, and discovering different pathways that this medium can portray a certain idea. And all of her sculptures inhabit the spaces in completely different ways. This one feels like a million little pieces, and this one feels the same way, but you have that arc of the red glass that I always see a figure in everything, but it feels figurative to me, the way it's got this gesture, which is really exciting. All right, let's go to Dorian. Who is this artist? So who you're looking at is Christy Belcourt. She is a Matisse visual artist, uh, but she is from Toronto. And she does this amazing, amazing work uh, that really gives tribute to the beadwork. Uh, that's also a Matisse uh, tradition. So if you look at all of those small little dots on the areas, those are all beadwork. That's all beadwork. So I think that her attention to detail is really beautiful. Also, the images and spiritual nature that she captures is amazing but she's also really good at shape, despite all those details. Kat, why do you think the shape is important in her work? I think shape is able to ground the composition. If it was all entirely little minuscule details, I think at a certain point you will just look at it as a pattern and something your eyes will sort of fuzz over and not quite explore the composition. But the instant that you have shape, you have some grounding large forms that can guide your eye through the composition. And I, I love these pieces. Wow. I'm like re really glad that Dorian has introduced us to her. Dorian, what's this? So this is actually a piece she did in collaboration uh, with Valentino. They had reached out to her because they actually really loved this piece she did. Uh, and I think that it's amazing that something so beautiful was able to also translate into fabric. And me being someone who's working with fabric and textiles a lot now, I think it's amazing just to see the final result and how it still keeps that same essence. Tell us in the chat, we do have the list of the artists in the video description below, but have you heard of any of these artists? Because Kat, I had to dig to find a lot of these artists. Did you find that was the case too? I agree. I think it's just a case of, you know, underrepresented populations on broad uh, stages. 
it, that's just the case across the world. But I'm really glad that we're able to have the resources such as the internet um, and being able to leaf through different museum catalogs and websites to be able to find these artists out there. I confess that sometimes I get really tired of hearing about the same artists over and over and over again. Have you had that sentiment, Dorian? All the time, because the world is full of amazing creatives and a lot of the creatives that we're able to have access to are always the same ones. And I feel like being able to understand where not only indigenous artists are coming from, but just all artists in general, I think it's really important to just see the different mediums and different takes people have. I mean, I feel like assembling the slideshow, I learned a lot. I learned about all these techniques that I'd never heard of before. So it's a good example that sometimes we do have to dig to find these artists who have less representation. For example, the reason I found this artist, Aluai Puladon, who is part of the Paiwan people in Taiwan is because my mother has talked to me about Aboriginal people in Taiwan, and I never would have searched for that if she hadn't told me about that. And I also learned about her weaving technique, which is called Lemic Alec. And where would I ever <laughs> learn about that unless I was a textiles major? And even then I probably wouldn't know about that. And Kat, I think what struck me about these pieces is that they're all woven, but they do have a chaotic feel to them. I think it's actually deceptively chaotic. It's chaotic, but it's still structural. And I think it's still very calculated. I mean, you have to do a very particular technique to be able to achieve this feeling of structured chaos and not a messy, like unconsidered chaos. Like when you look at the zoom up, oh my gosh, like every single fiber in this sculpture had to have been considered. And so I think this is just a demonstration of the mastery around this craft to be able to create something so structured, but also at once very chaotic. And a lot of these techniques are rooted in the tradition of their culture, but Dorian, what amazes me is when you take traditional techniques and apply them into a contemporary context. Yes, uh, and actually an artist that you guys will see shortly does that very well. But I think that's the beauty of it is finding ways to not, um, not necessarily modernize it, but find a way to bring it into modern day without it feeling almost too out of the ordinary because if you can find ways to kind of connect the past and the future there's a really beautiful blend of creation that happens how many of you guys here have drawn from your culture your identity for choosing your materials because the stuff that I do, I just am like, oh, I think I'll use this material. It doesn't have a lot to do with my identity, but I know for some people that is the case. Kat, who's this artist? Ooh, uh, Carla Hemlock is a quilter. So everything that she does, well, most things that she does is quilt work. And uh, she comes from the Mohawk Nation territory, which is near Montreal in Canada. And what's fun about Carla Hemlock is her husband is also an artist who is a woodworker and makes cradle boards, as in the boards that you would use to swaddle a baby in, <laughs> um, in accordance to probably Mohawk Nation tradition. But particularly in Carla Hemlock's work, she pays a lot of homage to the Mohawk people, as well as um, environmental causes such as fracking and the detrimental effects of it. And there is a piece that I put in that is just a row of red um, men, exactly. That's actually paying tribute particularly to the Mohawk Nation men who built high, rise, high rises in New York City and all of their unrecognized labor. During we talked about technique, but what struck me is that a lot of these themes are very much about the framework of where these people are from and some of the historical events that have occurred in their lives. What do you think of that? Yeah, no, I love 
Well, first off, this one just makes you think of the art there a little bit. Just got to say. <laughs> <laughs> one um, color. It's it's beautiful, though. Uh, for me, I relate to this in a unique way because this makes me immediately go to Pittsburgh where I picture the steel workers sitting on a steel beam eating their lunches. So, yeah, I don't know. For me, I looked at this piece and I had a very unique interpretation of it immediately. It's a little hard to see, but in the border, there are images of New York City that are patched together. And then you also have the skyline down here. So I think one thing I realized about a lot of these artists, so much of it has to do with location, where they're from, and what is specific to that area. Also notice the one star that was in that too. What is that? Yeah, there's only How one star that's right above the uh, second guy from the right side. Hmm. Kat, what do you think that is? I could not tell you what that means. <laughs> but I will say that, Dorian, you're not far off. This is actually based off of the very famous, like, around 1930s photograph of a row of Mohawk Nation men sitting on a steel beam. Um, just suspended over New York City without any safety precautions. But as for the store, I'm actually not sure what that means. And I love the way mm. this turtle is so simple. The claws are really playful. And then you have this mesmerizing spiral in the center. And so to me, she has a brilliant sense of shape. So we have some really good comments and we really appreciate everybody's various points of view. So I wanna highlight just a few of these so we can dig into this a little bit more because we had an earlier comment because we were talking about visibility. Of course, I can't find it now, but uh, <laughs> here it is. So Edie says, perhaps those underrepresented artists need to do more effective networking. And we have some responses. Ginger says, Edie, it probably isn't networking. It's just racism. Edie says, I'm afraid I disagree. The racism accusation is too easy. We have no idea how these artists are running their careers. Well, we did talk about visibility. And again, another follow-up from Ginger. And I do appreciate that you guys are able to offer various points of view. Kat, what do you think about that? Because yes, visibility and networking are not exclusive. Mm. I think it's a little tricky because networking requires you to have access mm -hmm. to the connection of somebody else. And I think the key thing here is accessibility. Not a lot of people have accessibility. For instance, somebody who perhaps was born and raised in the gallery art scene in New York will obviously have a lot more visibility and therefore accessibility to network. But somebody say, for instance, uh, I think, yeah, Tahniba Natani, which who we will talk about soon. She was born and raised in New Mexico, which is like a very different scene than the gallery scene in New York. And therefore not a lot of accessibility to connections to quote, make it, unquote, in the fine arts world. Oftentimes you guys would be shocked at the nepotism that's in the art world. And unfortunately, visibility does have a lot to do with who you know. And how, what's your take on that? Because it sort of infuriates me how unfair it is. Me or Dorian? <laughs> Oh, sorry, Dorian. <laughs> That's what I meant to say. My oh, fault. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, for me, it's interesting because, like, I'm from Pittsburgh, for instance, and there's art culture there that's been increasingly getting better. But when I came up to Providence, I saw how different it was being so close to RISD, being close to Boston, being close to New York, and also as a Black designer there are a lot of things happening so obviously people wanted to kind of play their cards right so they were asking a lot of black designers to do things for a short amount of periods of time and then they kind of fizzled out in a sense so there are moments where like yes you can attribute it to not having a strong network but there are a lot of people who utilize race and weaponize it in a sense 
where it's like, okay, black is a fad now, or being Asian or being whatever minority possible. Great. Excellent comments from everybody. Keep them coming. Uh, Dorian, who is this artist? So this is Ja Kujus. Uh, she also goes by Megan O'Brien, which is her actual government name. But her uh, former or her grandmother's maternal great grandmother's name was also Ja Kujus uh, from her Hahada language, which means dear woman. So yeah, just had to read that to make sure. But she is a weaver who works in traditional uh, Yilkuwu, which stands for Raven's Tale, and Naksin, which is Chilkat textiles, uh, so all native. Uh, she does this because it pays tribute to one of the most complex and most highly devoted forms of making. So I think it's really beautiful that she takes this kind of old, looking textile uh, and gives it new life and redesigns it and creates this new meaning. And she has this thing called ancient couture. So it's like really cool or native couture. Kat, what do you think about this? I don't even know what to call this garment. It's not like I'm saying this is a shoe. Is there a word for this, Dorian? So I'm pretty sure that those are just traditional, like those are uh, not leg warmers, but they're more like Accessories. Okay. Uh, Kat, what do you think about this? You don't see this every day. Yeah, you don't. But what I find really fascinating about this is I understand it's coming from traditional roots. I mean, I see the particular textile, I see the patterning, and it just harkens back to something traditional for me. But what I also see is these very modern red heels and the way the ankle strap actually wraps around the traditional um, textile. And I think what's really cool here is blending the traditional textile and um, clothing with modern day clothing. And I actually don't think they look so disparate. I think they actually work together really well. Uh, Dorian, do you know what nation she's from? So I've been trying to find, she works off of two names and it's been kind of, eh, but I will make sure that I find that and I will throw it in the discord after this live stream. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, it was not easy to get information because what we try to do a lot is to figure out the pronunciation in advance. And I looked up some of the videos of the artists that I chose and a lot of the interviews, they're speaking their own language. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't find <laughs> the pronunciation for a lot of these artists. So again, that's another thing about the visibility. So I wanted to go back up because a lot of you guys have your own stories. Sonnet says, I did a printmaking piece once of a sunset and the ocean and clouds was a black woman with an Afro. Her eye was the sun. I was trying to show our hair is beautiful as we are often told it's not. I mean, Kat, those are such powerful stories. Yeah, and I think that the way we connect with other people is to deliver them through storytelling. I think that Sonnet 18 is doing that wonderfully through the printmaking medium. Amanda says, collaborated with an artist from the same area as me and we use antique tractor pieces for some sculpture pieces. Everyone in our family were farmers. What do you think of that, Dorian? I think that it's sick. <laughs> <laughs> because for me, I love finding found materials. Also, just being able to make use of what you have is a very important of making. And going back to like that statement before about having a network. Also, even if you don't have a network, it is possible to make things work. It's just a lot harder. So you making a piece from antique tractor pieces is sick. <laughs> Like, it's so sick. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, thank you so much for M. Potter, who says, the star symbolizes the lives of those Mohawk workers who lost wow. their lives building the high rises. So thank you so much, M. Potter, for that information, because a lot of times you guys do the research for us. We also have Karasu, who says, as well as how, oh, wait, sorry, this is the wrong comment. <laughs> There's another comment from Karasu. Here it is. I went to Prophetstown State Park in Indiana yesterday. There was a reconstructed village based around the culture of indigenous people who lived there in the 1800s. I mean, this is where I wish I could just send everybody everywhere 
to have that experience because it's very different when you're in that place. And we've mm -hmm. talked about how location is a big part of these artists and their work. Mm. My pick is John Marunjal. And at first glance, I thought, oh, these are paintings. They're not though. They are this extraordinary technique. And so he's Australian born Kabukan and part of the Kunichku people. And he paints on bark using mm -hmm. things like clay and earth pigments. And it's a form of cross hatching, essentially. And you can see up close here, he's laying it down. And so actually every line you see here is a piece of bark, which I can't even conceive of. And it's such a great example that sometimes we miss the whole picture because we're looking at a photograph and it looks super flat. And I just wish there are ways to communicate these techniques more. And Dorian, I wish that a lot of them were better documented. Yeah, I think that's also why I watched National Geographic, to be honest. It's <laughs> rediscovering and like, also like unearthing these almost forbidden like <laughs> methods in a sense, because we've worked so hard to discover how to try and get as close to as possible as the like ancient ways or the uh, native ways. And I think that this is just such a beautiful job of, it's very raw and visceral and I love that. I just think that it really brings out a lot of the piece that it normally would. And Kat, I imagine that the color scheme has a lot to do with the materials. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you did say something about earth pigments and I see all of that in all of these works. I think what's really inherent about these pieces is the medium and the sources from which those mediums come from. And it's sort of this sort of beautiful cyclical thing where you take from the earth and you kind of give back to the earth in the form of reconstructed earth. And I find that to be present in all of these works, I really wish I could see these in person. I think it would be an extremely magical and totally different experience if you were to able you were able to see this from different points of views. If you were to able to, oh my gosh, I can't speak. If you were able to <laughs> walk around it. I just love the hatching. It's hard to see in the still. I think I have one that's a little bit more of a close up here, but it's basically cross hatching that's going up and down and side to side. Because I think from a distance, it can sort of look like just a, textured painted area and so that's where i think it's really helpful if we can find information about how the work is created because it is so different and by the way thank you everybody for helping with our research amanda has information about jod kujas that was on the instagram account that she has and this is great kim says call the nation's offices after hours they often say the name of their nation in their voice messages. That is brilliant. I really mm. like that. Thank you so much for telling us about that. And DeMarcaba says, it's so wonderful you're doing this. Very rarely do I see videos that make efforts to showcase this beautiful work that oftentimes is unknown and hidden. Great learning opportunity here. Absolutely. I mean, there's lots of artists that are in museums and I mean, a couple of these artists are, but the sort of big art world names and everything, they're interesting, but I learned a lot from looking at these artists and I, I was so happy to see what Dorian and Kat did. Calera, out of curiosity, <laughs> do you feel though that as like a, like, because I would say you're a pretty well-known artist now. <laughs> Do you feel that there are ways that other artists could promote themselves in those areas that don't have like the same network of uh, opportunities and accessibility? It's very tricky. I think the first step for some people is just working locally getting involved with the people who are right there. Because 
we can say, oh yeah, New York City is the capital of the art world. But I think sometimes if you just go straight to that, it's like if I was trying to get a sponsorship from something and I was like, I'm going to go ask Nike. And it's like, no, nah, I don't think Nike is the place to start. <laughs> and so if you do something that's local, you get some experience first about what it's like to network, how to practice putting yourself out there, and then you tackle something bigger. I think that is easier. Kat? I wanted to pull up a previous comment that actually like Eddie Sedgwick had said in terms of the internet is democratizing a lot of things. Yep. Mm. And I totally agree with Clara in that work locally first, that way you get that real life in-person connection and in-person viewership. But at a certain point, you're gonna wanna have to branch out of that. And so in that case, I think the internet is such a powerful, powerful tool for that. Internet has democratized, well, access. Well, there's a lot of accessibility when it comes to the internet. And I think that that is a very valid next step after local showing and local effort. But Josh also says another part of networking that is overlooked is the way algorithms work on social media. If you're yes. not specifically artists with or following indigenous artists, it's hard to find new ones in your feed. Well, another thing is that if we go back and we look at the last artist, I hate to say this, but this would not perform well on social media. It's mm -hmm. very subtle. It is not rainbow colors. And it takes more than three seconds to absorb it. I mean, this is work I need to look at it for a long time, which is why museums are extremely important. Because when people go to a museum, they've carved out space in their head that I'm going to look. And it's not just scrolling in that type of thing. And that, that frustrates me, Dorian, what do you think? Yeah, I think one of the biggest like turning points in my kind of art decision-making was finally being able to sit in the gallery and understand why certain painters did certain things or like underpaintings. The, like you even did a video recently on the TikTok where you have like the look at the process of an artist. You can see like the hash marks and the hash lines that um, were underneath one of the paintings. Stuff like that allows for not only me to feel more confident as a maker, but it gives me ideas on how I can approach projects. And I think that's important for everyone to have that opportunity. Kim says, I Lulum is a good example of this. They are an art and design house well known on Vancouver Island, but they've also been featured in Vogue. And some of it, it stuff just comes up. For example, I was flown to Canada to talk about butts on a Canadian TV show because I put out a video on YouTube about butts in art history. Who knew? And I can't control that. I, I can't apply to talk about butts on a TV show, but I can put myself out there. So it sort of goes both ways that, yes, there are more opportunities, but there are also frustrating parts of it as well. All right, Kat, who's this artist? This is Tahnabat Natani, and she is from the Navajo tribe. Uh, her textile work is primarily called Diné textiles, which generally means back in the day when Spanish colonizers came to the southwest parts of the U.S., they brought sheep with them, and with sheep came wool. And so the indigenous peoples in this area started to incorporate wool into their traditional textile making, which eventually became coined as Diné textiles. And Tatnaba Natani prim primarily works in Diné textiles. Something I really love about her work is obviously the traditional roots, the colors and medium of it, but also the modular abilities of all of her works. For instance, this is something like a shawl, but it can be a shawl or a wrap or a shoulder uh, sling, or it can be a skirt. And so every single piece that she makes does have this modular quality to it. And I think it totally transforms a piece depending on how you wear it. Doreen, you are a resident fashion designer. What do you think of this? <laughs> I love it. I immediately like started scrambling to like look for stuff in my room. Like, okay, I, like that's an idea right there. Uh, because, <laughs> like I actually got a collection of simple, similar uh, swatches I've been working with. Uh, and I think that that was a really beautiful way of using it. 
and the fact that it's also multifunctional. Chef's kiss. Chef's kiss. <laughs> and wow. a lot of these are actually pretty abstract. I mean, I guess you could look at this and say, I see a landscape, I see a sky, but you know something, that wasn't my first reaction when I saw this piece. I saw it more as these flowing colors and especially towards the bottom where it starts to really just be about a series of lines, but every single line and shape is a little bit different. And I love the unique quality of every line in this piece. So Kat, for me, I see a lot of subtlety in this work. Yeah, I agree. And I mean, you describe it as a line, but I, I also think that there is a lot of form in this piece as well. Plus, I want to point out that every line is different. It has an organic quality to it. It ebbs and flows. It's wide and thin. And I think that's something you can usually get with traditional media. You kind of go with the organic nature of the media. I think something I tell students often when teaching digital art is you fall into the trap of it looking too digitized, looking too yeah. perfect, too machine rendered, such as making a gradient and how perfect that is in a machine. But when you do it yourself, the imperfections are actually what make the piece more magical. By the way, artist Zena says during COVID, I got hooked up with the Emerid, I think maybe that's a typo, or maybe not, I, maybe I'm totally wrong, sorry about that. They present information on Central American and Native American arts. They are based out of Arizona. This is another good point, because people were asking about how you find these artists. And I know not everybody can travel, but when you travel, don't just go to the big museums. Mm -hmm. Go to some of the more regional museums because they are more likely to show work like this and that's extremely important. What what are we looking at, Dorian? Oh my God, I'm so embarrassed. <gasps> I guess I saw that and I just thought it was supposed to be America. Oh my God, this is terrible. It honestly looks oh, yeah, really everybody. cool. We should take a yeah. trip there. <laughs> Anybody want to fly the trip? trip. <laughs> this is right. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about Rosanna Polino. So, Rosanna Paulino is from Sao Paulo. She was born in 1967, but I just wanted to read a quote of hers. Uh, she said, I'm concerned with the issue of archetypes and psychological psychology, a black female psychology. So her research includes uh, the construction of myths, and that's mainly uh, not only aesthetical pillars, but the psychic influence that it has on us, because it really does impact culture when you have mythology involved in it. Uh, and then she also has produced a practice of reconstructing images that highlight images of memory, family, uh, and basically what it means to be Black in Brazil. And in this piece specifically, all the stitch lines over the mouth was actually to talk about the silencing of Black bodies in Brazil, which I think is such a unique way of commentating on that. Uh, with having a piece of your family like silenced and that's presented in the museum. I think that's really interesting. I look at her work and I find it so mesmerizing in a way that it's hard to look at. I mean, I look at this last portrait and the way the stitching has been applied. I mean, I, I feel the physical pain that yeah. somebody has had that happen from a physical point of view but then you look at how haunting the portrait is and especially because i think a lot of embroidery tends to have a lot of color a lot of it is very I, i'm not saying the whole genre i'm just saying in general people don't think about black and white portraits when it comes to embroidery formats but this piece blew me away this is an installation and if you look up close these are the individual figures. Kat, what do you think of these? Oh my gosh, that's crazy. I, what I love about this installation is no matter what point of view you look at it in, there's so much to explore. You look at it far away and you say, oh, this whole hub is converging towards the corners and sort of trickling through the corners of the walls. And then you look up close and you say, wow, every single drop in this sculpture is a really well-considered 
figure. I think that this artist is really capitalizing on the use of multiples in a lot of her work. So previously with the portraits, there were many of them. And then you look up close and you are once again, you have these revelations as you look up close at these portraits. But then you look at the sculptural piece from far away, you see the multiples and then you get up close and you say, wow, every single piece here is essential. This piece too, I think a lot of her work is just as much what we don't see as what we mm -hmm. do see. So for example, the mouth was removed. Well, not removed, it was still there, but it was not visible. And same thing here, you have this yellow bar in front of the portrait. And Dorian, I think that's really startling for people because we associate portraits with eyes. Yeah, it goes to show you how, not pun intended, she sees herself. Like she feels unseen and unheard and I think that that's a common trend for a lot of people in a lot of places, but specifically her experience in Sao Paulo. So also being able to give tribute to like the space itself by having a crab and having like the floral fauna that's normally there. It, it tells a full story. And I think that really does kind of go towards that mythological route too, uh, in the piece that you guys liked a lot, because I don't ever see figures with like all the little, they almost look like tentacles. These? Yeah. Uma is saying, is it important to build relationships with artists of the same underrepresented group versus an artist group around a similar medium or find artists with the same themes, content as your work? Kat, what do you think? It's good to build relationships everywhere, no matter yes. what. <laughs> But I will also say it's good to build relate like true relationships, people who actually care about you and people that you care about. Because I think the main thing here is you need to build a community in which you feel supported and seen in a place where you can project your voice and know that it will reach the right ears. And sometimes you just have no idea who you're going to get along with. Sometimes as artists, there are nothing like me. And somehow we have the exact same dry sense of humor. And so we like each other. <laughs> I want to I want to add on to that point. I have a literary agent because I'm friends with my my friend who is a furniture designer. Like I would have never thought I would get a graphic novel literary agent <laughs> by being friends with my furniture major friend. <laughs> so you never know, like you, so long as you have relationships with people who care about you, they will look out for you. Mm hmm. All right, the next artist is Jeremy. Oh my gosh, there's a typo in there. Shoot. I'm sorry, it's supposed to be F-R-E-Y. My apologies. The, the Instagram is correct, so sorry about that, you guys. He is from Maine, from the Passamaquoddy Indian Township. Again, sorry if I mispronounced that. And these are woven baskets, and you can see they are using... Wabanaki weaving techniques. I mean, I look at this and the craftsmanship, oh my God, it's flawless, immaculate work. And we were talking earlier about digital media, very fast for making changes. And especially in context like editorial illustration, it's really great. But Doreen, isn't it incredible that people still do things that are this time consuming? I'm still trying to understand how this is even a woven piece. Like it looks like a Fabergé egg. Like this well, is- Well, this is how it starts. <laughs> that is beautiful. Like when people really do sit and learn and try to master something, especially as like technically advanced as that, the results are so beautiful almost every time. Kat, what do you think? I'm just blown away. I don't want to keep looking at this. I also would like to see it in person. But yes. another thing I would love to see is this piece halfway done. <laughs> I would love to see the process of it. How is this even being constructed? I mean, you have a photo of the artist at work and you sort of see the structural integrity behind the vessel. But you know, to get like a particular swirl, to get a particular spike, it must have a very 
unique foundation that I would actually love to see the in-progress work of this piece. Mm -hmm. And 7A says, this basket is amazing. I would never have expected such spiky texture. It looks so cool. Yeah, and the structure of it. Oh my gosh, I tried weaving with Reed once for this workshop and it's so hard to get the right tension. It was like too tight or too loose. And I, I just don't know how people are able to do this other than it's just an incredible number of hours to practice and hone a technique like this just is extraordinary. We do have spaces in our color palettes workshop in April, also drawing hands and feet and the imaginary landscapes workshop. This is where you get to work with me in real time with a small group of artists and we have a really fruitful experience in there. Please join Kat and I, we will be in the discord right after the live stream and we're gonna do stage sessions. So that's where you can talk to us on voice. I know there are a couple of questions in here that we didn't get to. You wanna meet in the post live streams stage channel. We do have a giveaway, which is everybody in Discord gets one free session of Open Studios Club. If you are in the Patreon group, you get two and same thing with workshop participants. Join our Patreon group. This is where you get to share your art and casual weekly voice sessions. I write very, very long critiques to people when you post in there. And it's a great place to make art friends because it's a much smaller group than the public channels. We have over 11,000 members. So it's a little easy to get lost in there, but the Patreon group makes it very possible. Thank you so much to our incredible top Patreon supporters. You are all so critical to our budget and I'm so grateful every single day. Art Prof has a podcast, it's available on Spotify and also on iTunes and subscribe for more art tutorials, critiques and business tips because apparently Buddy loves to rest his feet against the wall. I caught him doing this earlier <laughs> this week and I think you all need to know about his weird sleeping habits. <laughs> Thank you so much for everybody. We'll see you next time, bye. <laughs>